Hi, I'm Sarah. And I'm Megan. We're two moms with eight kids between us, from little to grown. We're in different areas of the country and in different stages of life. But we both know that motherhood's a lot easier when real moms share tips and encouragement. And remind you that it's really all going to be okay. We're not experts. We're parents who've been there. We're not perfect. We're real. Welcome to the Mom Hour. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Mom Hour. I'm Megan Francis, and in this episode, I am talking with Julie Revelant, a mom of two, food and health writer, and the host of the brand new podcast, Food Issues. So full disclosure, Sarah and I worked with Julie to help her launch this podcast, and we definitely don't interview all of our coaching clients on the Mom Hour, but I really thought you would all love to hear from Julie to learn more about her approach to raising little foodies, as well as some of the food issues that families are coping with right now. Julie and I talk about everything from how the school lunch program has struggled and changed during the pandemic, how kids and families are coping with the changes to their routines and eating habits, and how junk foods are being marketed to kids through video games, kid influencers, and get this, even their online learning platforms. I know you're going to want to hear more, so let's jump into my conversation with Julie. Hi, Julie. So excited to have you on the show. Thank you, Megan. I'm so excited to be here. Well, this is podcast launch week for you, and I know that is a really exciting time, Um, and I'm really thrilled because I just know so many of our listeners are going to love um, the the issues you're covering and just the take that that you have on um, all these issues, these food issues. So before we jump into that, let's just like cover your background as a journalist. Um, I know that you've been a health journalist and a writer. That's how you and I met. Um, So you've done that for quite some time, but Eventually, that led you to taking an interest in food and its impact on health, especially with kids. So tell us a little bit about that. Sure. So I wrote a column called Healthy Mama for Fox News for nearly six years, and I covered uh, maternal, postpartum, pregnancy, children's health and nutrition and some men's general health thrown in there as well. And I've also written for First for Women magazine and Woman's World, Everyday Health and, and a few other outlets. And so you know, I also provide content marketing, copywriting, and brand journalism services for business-to-business healthcare clients. And, and at that time, I was writing consumer-facing content as well. And so at that time, my daughter was really young. I have a nine and a seven-year-old, and she was uh, probably a baby or a toddler. And I was working with a concierge medicine practice, so a provider's office. And I was learning more about functional medicine, which is focused on identifying and addressing the root cause of disease and also how food can prevent, reverse, and treat disease and dysfunction. And so I became really interested in nutrition and passionate about this idea that there's so much chronic disease in America and it can be prevented largely, not all of the time, but largely if we simply ate healthy and raise kids to be healthy eaters and So, you know, as a kid myself, I grew up in the 80s and I ate everything processed. So steak gums and TV dinners and (laughs) soda and chips. I love it. You know, it's so funny. About every five years, I have this recurring um, like steak gums is not on my radar anymore. But every (laughs) every few years, I'll be like, wait, did I hallucinate some a product called steak gums? It's like like, (laughs) it's like basically like chopped up flattened meat. Right. I don't really remember what it is, but it's it's it was delicious as a kid, but it's gross. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I think most of the foods we ate as kids just, they just turned my stomach thinking about yeah. them. It's like traumatizing. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, you know, my mom, she was working full time and she had a part time job and she went to school for um, to get her master's degree. So for two years, while she did that, every Tuesday for two years, we ate hot dogs because <laughs> she needed my brother to kind of take the lead on dinner. Um, so yeah. when I had my, when I had my daughter almost 10 years ago, I really wanted to turn it around for her. And I had received this book called the baby and toddler cookbook by Karen Ansel. And I was so blown away by all the recipes because I couldn't believe that you could feed a baby, you know, risotto and lentil stew and all of these amazing things. And so I started to introduce all these new exciting flavors and tastes and textures. And I realized that not only was serving, serving healthy meals, one of the biggest responsibilities as a parent, but what I fed her from the start could set the stage for healthy eating habits throughout her life. And so again, at the same time, I was writing for Fox news and I had interviewed Catherine McCord from the site, we licious. And I was asking her, it was about homemade baby food. And I was asking her about sneaking vegetables because you know, nowadays that's, you see a lot of posts from other moms and bloggers and recipes to sneak vegetables. And you're, you know, how great is that? I got my 
to eat broccoli and because I pureed it into right. baked good. Um, and so I said, you know, how do you feel about that? And she said, and I quote, we don't want a country full of 18 year olds who never realized they ate broccoli before. Right. And yes. so I thought that was so funny. Um, and, but it really transformed my way of thinking about feeding kids. So I became really passionate about that. So then you moved into blogging about that. I know you've been blogging about, um, you've got recipes and ideas for for helping your kids become, I believe you say, healthy little foodies. Um, so tell us a little bit about the work that you've been doing on your site. Yeah, sure. So in 2017, I started my site and I actually was trying to shop around a book idea around these topics. And um, it just wasn't the right time and probably wasn't the right idea. Um, so maybe one day that will happen. But, you know, I was advised by a few agents to start uh, a site. And so I started this site. And yes, it's science based expert insight um, and real life practical tips for parents to uh, get their kids to eat their vegetables and get their kids to try new foods. And, you know, I try to come from the perspective of it doesn't really have to be that hard. It just takes consistency because I'm, I was able to do it with my kids. Yeah. Okay. So you've been writing this website for a few years now, and then you decide to jump into podcasting. So tell us a little bit about that. Um, I know we're going to get more specifically into the guests that you've got coming and topics, um, a little bit later, but I just want to hear why you decided to go from blog to podcast. Yeah. So, you know, it's funny. I haven't really been listening to podcasts all of these years, um, right. but kind of got into it uh, like a year ago. And um, I was I was I was pitching myself to be a guest on other podcasts in order to market my site. And so it was uncomfortable for me because I was used to being the one who interviewed, who did all the interviews. And so it was definitely in my comfort zone. But every time I got off a podcast interview, I was so elated and mm. so excited about it. And so I read a book about podcasting and uh, started thinking about it, praying about it, asking people, do you think this is a crazy idea? <laughs> and, uh, you know, especially in the midst of a pandemic and, yeah. um, thought like, what better time though, right? Like right. we're all kind of shifting our perspectives on what we want out of life. And so I realized, yeah, let me jump into this. And so I, I reached out to you and, and you've been amazing helping me and guiding me through this. So yeah, I'm really excited. Well, we're all excited and we're going to take a quick break. But when we get back, we're going to dive a little more into what the podcast Food Issues has in store for the first season. You have interviewed some amazing guests. You've got a really cool slate of topics that you're covering, ones that I think um, a lot of moms in our audience are going to love. So we're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back. We are welcoming back our sponsor, Literati Kids Today. And Sarah, our listeners are loving this Try Before You Buy subscription book club for kids. So you and I both remember that feeling from childhood of being like transported to another place through the books we read, right? Well, now our kids can get that feeling of traveling to new places through books too. And we don't have to sort through thousands of titles and lists because Literati has that figured out. Yes. Each month, Literati sends you five vibrantly illustrated children's books, bringing that magic of reading right to your door. And with your $9.95 monthly subscription, you'll always have new books to explore with your kids. But here's the cool part. When the box arrives, you choose what you'd like to purchase and send the rest back for free. I love that so much, Sarah. And you know, the way kids go in phases with their interests and reading levels, I can see this being one less thing for busy moms to have to put on their lists. Each Literati Kids shipment is thoughtfully tailored by education experts with stories and books that are specifically chosen to spark new interests and nurture your kids' curiosity. My kids are loving the books Literati sent to our house, and we have an awesome deal for our listeners. Head to literati.com slash the mom hour for 25% off your first two orders. Select your child's book club and start them on a literary journey like no other. Literati.com slash the mom hour is the only place to find 25% off your first two orders of this one of a kind book subscription. The most joyful way to foster a lifelong love of learning. That's literati.com slash the mom hour. Sarah, I have noticed lately that every time I go to the store, my kids are asking me to bring them some kind of treat. <laughs> they don't always do that. But I think with winter settling in here and school and just the last 10 months being so weird, everyone's looking for a little comfort right now, you know? And one of their most requested treats is junk cereal. I mean, I get it. Who doesn't want to dive into a bowl of fruity O's at the end of a rough day? <laughs> but, you know, I also don't feel great about essentially feeding them bowls of pure sugar either. I know exactly the kind of slump you're talking about and agree that sometimes a bowl of cereal is the perfect pick-me-up. 
That's why we love our sponsor, Magic Spoon. They provide the flavor and experience we all remember from our favorite childhood cereals, but without the junk. Magic Spoon cereals contain no sugar, and each serving has 11 grams of complete protein and only 3 net grams of carbs. It's also gluten-free, grain-free, soy-free, and GMO-free. Yes, we love Magic Spoon by the bowlful or just by the handful. And it really does scratch that itch for sugar cereal, but without the sugar. Magic Spoon comes in six flavors, fruity, frosted, cocoa, blueberry, cinnamon, and peanut butter. So you can surprise and delight your family a whole bunch of different ways. Go to magicspoon.com slash mom to design your own variety pack and try it today. And be sure to use our promo code mom at checkout to save $5 off your order. Again, that's magicspoon.com slash mom and use the code mom for $5 off your order. Okay, Julie. So your podcast, Food Issues, launched earlier this week. Um, You've got an amazing first season. And I would love for you just to kind of broadly talk about some of the experts that you that you talked to and some of the topics you're covering. I think that there's just so much information here. Great. Yeah, I, I'm really excited about all the experts that I'm interviewing. So the the first episode is about feeding kids in 2021. And I interviewed Dr. Marlene Schwartz from the Rudd Center for Food Policy and Obesity. And so we gave a state of the union about feeding kids, especially during a pandemic. And so we talked about the impact of COVID-19 on food insecurity and the charitable food system, uh, COVID's impact on childhood obesity rates, because we all know our, our all of our routines have been totally disrupted. Uh, how COVID-19 has also shined a light on chronic disease in American health inequities and why we really need to ensure kids have access to healthy food and learn healthy eating habits early on. I also interview Colin Schwartz, who's Deputy Director of Legislative Affairs at the Center for Science and the Public Interest. And we talked all about school lunch and how COVID has changed how school lunch is delivered, access, what it looks like from nutritional profile and uh, waivers that have happened and what the Trump administration did and what what we hope uh, the Biden administration will do. Um, I also talked to Dr. Ann Fischel, who's the co-founder of the Family Dinner Project. And of course, families are sharing so many more meals these days Mm. because we have nowhere to go. Um, But it's a great thing. And so we talked about, you know, the science back benefits of family meals and uh, ways that you can make meals fun and virtual meals fun. Um, so for example, one of the ideas she gives is to have an Iron Chef virtual competition with family members over Zoom or your, oh my your preferred platform. That's yeah. fun. Um, I also talked to Bettina Elias Siegel, who I am a big fan of, and she's a healthy school lunch advocate and author of Kid Food. And we talked about food marketing, advertising, and kid food influencers and sneaky ways kids are being targeted Um, basically everywhere they go. Uh, Cooking with kids through COVID, we talk about how to cut down on food waste, uh, food is medicine, and um, the current state of breastfeeding, how how to boost your kids' gut health with Dr. William Lee, who's author of Eat to Beat Disease, how to cope with 24-7 food culture with Dr. Namali Fernando, who is a pediatrician and founder of the Dr. Yum Project, and also an episode about uh, healthy, you know, so-called healthy junk food. And is it really healthy for our kids? Wow. That is like so much information. I'm so excited. And I definitely don't want to give away all, you know, all the gems, but I do want to talk a little more in depth about some of these topics because they're obviously all things that we kind of know are happening, but if you're not in that world, it's, um, you don't know the ins and outs. And I guess you probably just don't have all the information. So One thing that came to mind as you were talking um, about the school lunch system is that's just something I've seen kind of shift around here when kids are moving in and out of school. You know, some kids are getting it at home. Some kids are getting it in school. That keeps changing. I know that's a really complicated system that you can't necessarily like, you know, um, parse out for us. But just tell me a little more about what you've learned about that disruption. Is that adding to the um, inequity and the, and the food instability? I know there's a different insecurity, sorry. Um, Just like kind of how COVID-19 is changing the school program. And then we can kind of dive more into how it's changing the way we eat in general. Yeah, absolutely. So it has changed in, in several key significant areas. So in October, the USDA extended the child nutrition waivers to provide free meals to all children through the end of the 2020-2021 school year. So initially it was, I guess it was for a few months and then they they allowed it 
to be free. So every child, regardless of need in America, gets free school meals. So this, you know, fills a vital need for many children who are either were already receiving free and reduced lunch, families who are now facing food insecurity because they lost a job or whatever the case is, um, or simply those who are having financial struggles. But again, it's open to everyone. And so it's, it's definitely filling that need. But there are concerns about what the nutritional profile of those meals are. I know in our school, um, it was kind of pretty bad before, and now it's just gotten so much worse. Um, although they still are, you know, obviously they have to provide fruits and vegetables, which is really important. And I've noticed that they've provided different fruits and vegetables, which is really great because kids, the more they're exposed to different foods, the more likely they, they are to uh, try those foods. Right. So another key area is that the USDA also implemented what is called the meal pattern waiver. So it allowed schools to serve meals that don't meet certain nutritional standards. So the waiver can be used for schools to bundle food. So instead of getting, say, five, you know, small curtains of milk, a family could receive a gallon of milk. Mm -hmm. Um, But so this this also helped with supply chain issues that we saw during COVID and Um, so they could say maybe, you know, this produce wasn't available or we can't provide the same amount of whole grains. So, so it did, it it was in in place for a good reason. Um, but Colin Schwartz has said that, um, it's, it's being resolved, but there are concerns that some schools are using these waivers without good reason. Uh, okay. Um, yeah. One thing that I thought of when I, when that, because my kids, we were picking up the school lunches. We live really close to the high school. And so when my kids were virtual for, I don't know, a couple of months, we were going over on Monday night and picking up a box of lunch food and bringing it home for them to make their school lunches. And what I thought was funny is that the stuff kids will eat in school because it's in front of them, they're not necessarily interested in being served at home. So that was one, like, that was kind of one, um, I guess, obstacle. Like they might've eaten the little baggie of carrots because they were at school but at home, that's probably not what they're going to reach for. So I ended up taking a lot of it and turning it into dinner. So I would just like open up all the little bags of vegetables and roast them and serve them at dinner time. And then there was all this weird other stuff, like those little uncrustable sandwiches that I didn't really want them to eat at all when they could make a perfectly good sandwich on whole wheat bread. You know, like, yeah, so it was kind of this weird sorting process where <laughs> I have a lot of stuff in my freezer right now that I'm not sure will ever see the light of day because I don't really want my kids to eat it. I'm glad yeah. I got some of the stuff. Um, and every now and then if they just want it for a snack, it's fine, but it's just, it's kind of funny, like how something that can work in a school setting, you bring it home and it's like, uh, how do I, how do I heat up this pre-cooked grilled cheese sandwich? I don't even know how to cook it. So, um, yeah, just like, just to piggyback off what you're saying, like the portions were weird when you get a million milk cartons sent to your house, but also the food itself doesn't just doesn't jive quite right, you know? Yeah, yeah, Yeah. absolutely. Yeah, that's funny. Um, And so there's other changes too. So kids are accessing these meals uh, in different ways. So it could be a grab and go when they come into school. It could be delivered to their classroom. It could be, like you said, the curbside pickup. Or because a lot of these schools are on distance learning, some kids are not able to get this food at all. And so about two weeks ago, President Biden issued an executive order to increase food assistance programs for kids who who are facing food insecurity and aren't getting these school meals that they desperately need. Um, And then there's also, you know, the school nutrition directors are dealing with staff cuts and trying to fund the programs. And there's a decline in revenue because there is less utilization and there's higher meal costs. Um, But experts are really hopeful because in 2019, Congress Congress introduced a meal, a bill to establish universal school meals program. So meaning everyone would get free school meals. Now, we don't know what the nutritional profile of those meals would be. They haven't indicated that. But um, the School Nutrition Association had recently also called for these universal school meals and 64 national organizations and associations have written President Biden and Vice President Harris to support it. Um, and so we're hopeful that that will happen. And, you know, I mean, there's been some, I've seen some articles about, um, about, uh, Jill Biden and, and she seems to be a really healthy food advocate. And so I'm hopeful that, you know, president Biden and the administration will kind of piggyback off of president Obama and, and like hit a reset on all of these, um, 
rolled axe and and really do what's right for the health of our kids. I love um, hearing that there are things moving in a positive direction there. And I just think it's really interesting how something like a pandemic could maybe expose some cracks in the system or some things that really need to be addressed anyway. Um, unfortunately, the short term sounds like it it's really changed things for the worse for a lot of people, but hopefully um, it'll get back on track. So that kind of led me to thinking about the fact that everything is different right and right now. And so many of the topics that you covered, like the state of um, family dinners or 24 seven snacking, which is something that has kind of bothered me as a trend for a while now, the fact that like nobody feels like they can go to a park without packing a whole bunch of snacks for their kids. Right now, since people aren't going places as much, is that changing? Or are other things being disrupted in a positive way um, by the changes we're going through? Yeah, it's a mixed bag, I would say. I mean, you know, the silver lining again to the pandemic is that families are prioritizing meals. So whether whether that's dinner, another meal that they're making, they have more time. And so they're sharing those meals together. And there was a recent poll done and it found that 95, 94% of people said they're cooking the same amount or more than they were before the pandemic started. And another survey found that 73% of families with school age children now report they've been able to spend more time together as a family before starting their work day or school day. So they're, they're prioritizing breakfast. Um, and then there was another recent survey that found that one in three consumers said they ate healthier in 2020, which is good. And those under the age of 45 were most likely to make more healthful choices. So those are definitely the, the people with kids for the most right. part. Um, but eating habits of 19% of those in that survey became less healthy during the past year. So I think that it's definitely, I think we're all trying to eat healthier, but it's not easy, right? I mean, we're all working from home. We've got the kids at home learning or they're just home more. And I mean, I know there's so many times I walk you know, out of my office at five o'clock and I look in, in the refrigerator and it's like, oh my gosh, what am I going to make for dinner? And what did my kids eat for lunch? Right. Like I wasn't paying attention. Right. You were busy working. Um, I mean, and yeah. that's not part of your routine. And also it's not even easy to shop right now. So it's like, even that adds a whole nother layer. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And so we're just you know, I think all of us are snacking more, we're stress eating, we're eating comfort foods. And and of course, we're, you know, I'd say most of us are probably more sedentary. I mean, I prioritize workouts five to six days a week, but it's not the same yeah. the way it was when it's warmer out and the gym was open. Yeah. Yeah. So I can totally see why. I mean, it is a mixed bag. It's like everyone's people, not everyone, a lot of people are cooking more and trying harder, but they're but the odds are stacked against us in a totally new way. Um, yeah. One of the things that you talked about in that you mentioned was that there are kid food influencers. So first of all, we have to talk about that in a minute here. But you also mentioned before we got on our call that now there's concern about junk food being marketed through online learning, which just made me go, what? OK, uh -huh. so first of all, tell us about this kid food influencer world. I mean, I knew there were kid influencers. I've seen the unboxing toy kids and the crafters and all that. But I guess I did not realize that there was like a kid food influencer world out there too. So what kind of effect is that having? Well, I think what it is, is there's these kid influencers who, like you said, are unpacking toys and the parents are teaching them lessons. And it, it's so absurd when you watch it. And my kids <laughs> love watching it. I and I always say like, you're not allowed to watch this. This is ridiculous. And I try to explain to them that the families are making a lot of money doing this. Right. Um, and they just <laughs> don't get that. But yeah, there's these, these YouTubers, you know, kid YouTubers or families and whatever they're doing, it really doesn't matter. But YouTube then places ads on the videos for unhealthy food. Um, and so that's kind of where the concern mm, is now. And, you know, there it. was a recent study in, in the in pediatrics about these kid influencers. And um, it found that the highest paid YouTube influencer in 2018 and th 2019 was an eight year old who, get this, earns twenty six million dollars from advertisements <laughs> oh that appeared goodness. before the video. And then they do sponsored posts. So they do, you know, product placements that appear in the video. So, yeah, like, I guess that's what we're talking about when we talk about kid food influencers. Wow. I mean, you think about like the, what we grew up with and I could still rattle off four or five or six jingles, probably, you know, without much prompting for junk food that we grew up with. <laughs> and that's what we thought we were dealing with. And now 
so many kids don't watch TV that way anyway, anymore that it's like, okay, well, that's not happening, but it's still happening. It's just happening in a totally different, and I would say sneakier way because it doesn't feel like advertising quite as obviously sometimes. Yes, absolutely. And kids are none the wiser. So it's happening, social media, gaming, which mm. has shocked me, right? Um, sports sponsors, branded toys, corporate event sponsorships, product placements, athlete endorsements, um, which is really interesting because, you know, or, or celebrity for that matter. Yeah. So it's, you know, sports stars and you, you, you think that they're healthy, but yet they're endorsing junk food. Right. Um, and then, you know, so what's really upsetting to me is that there's food marketing in school cafeterias. And so in the episode with Bettina Elias Siegel, we, we talk quite at length about that. Um, but that's really, really concerning, right? You're sending your kids to school and they're being marketed soda and chips and junk food. Wow. Um, and then and then you mentioned the online learning thing. Is that something that's already happening? It's like, do we have to worry that our kids are going to be on their virtual learning platform and, you know, see an ad for Doritos? Or is that more like it, it's just kind of like, the possibility of it being part of that platform. And no, it's happening. Oh and, my gosh. and she told me about this. I had not heard about this, but there was a study done in December and it sound and it found that many popular educational websites are advertisement supported. So they did a review of 551 children's educational websites and it found that approximately 60% <gasps> had ads <laughs> or unclear policies around advertising, including policies on behavioral and contextual advertising. Um, so yeah, there's there's one app that I've seen, I've read in the studies um, that they call out in particular, and that's ABC. Yeah. Okay. Not if you're familiar with that, but I know my kids have definitely been on that. And it's and it's and it's being promoted by the school, right? Many times the schools tell my kids, you have to do 10 minutes on this app. Oh, or, yeah. Oh, my yeah. kids have been doing that for years. I, I mean, IXL is one that we have we have here and there's a whole bunch. And I don't know if they're advertising. I don't look at them because the teachers are telling them to look, you know, to do them. So I haven't vetted them. It's part of their right? schoolwork. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah. And I'm sure they're relying on it even more now because um, there's there just has to be so much reliance on working at home. And even if your kids are in school again, that just the way that they're able to do things in school has slowed down so much because of all the spacing and everything takes more time. So, uh, oh my goodness, more yeah. screens, more junk yeah. food. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, it's interesting when I was thinking like my first thought about the whole snacking culture, and I feel like we could do like a whole series of episodes just about snack culture. But this idea that kids have to have, you know, something in their mouths all the time was not the case when we were kids. Like if I was on, on a road trip and I was hungry, my mom would say, wait till we get there. But it does have this feeling like you have to have food with you all the time. And I guess when people are more stuck at home, that could just be more like, okay, you're bored, go eat. I, I could mm. see how the idea that kids have to eat that much and need to have a snack available at all times could really lead to a lot of really unhealthy home snacking. So did you did you talk about how COVID um, in the episode is has changed what like the schedule around eating at home looks like? Um, we talked a little bit about that. Yeah. Okay. I mean, all of our schedules are disrupted. And so, like we said, people are working and they have no idea what their kids are doing. Right. Um, you know, and, and they're just there. You're right. There's nothing to do. So they're bored and they're reaching for snacks and, you know, and there's no research right now about the, the effects of the pandemic on childhood obesity rates, although they are sky, you know, at an all time high, but anecdotally, pediatricians are saying, yeah, we're seeing kids in our offices and they're gaining 5, 10, 20 pounds. And this isn't something that we can just say, oh, once the pandemic is over, it'll go away. No, we need to deal with it now. Yeah. Um, so it's it's tough. I see it with my own kids and it, it's just hard because, you know, it's like, what do you do? Some, it's hard to get them to go move without me there. You right. Know? <laughs> yes. Yeah. And it's hard to get them to go move when they're like in your house, um, yeah. and uh, you know, and living in a cold weather place. It's even harder. Like you have to get really creative about ways for them to to move in meaningful ways. I mean, a little kid can maybe go play in a snowbank for an hour, but a bigger kid, they they just they're they're used to there being more structure around stuff and they're used to having you know, for better or for worse, and that could be a whole nother debate. They're, they're kind of used to having adults tell them how to move their bodies and when, um, and minus that <laughs> and eating, like they're kind of used to the structure in their lives that tells them when it's time to eat. And when that goes away, 
it does leave a void that I think is really confusing for kids. Yeah. 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 And, you know, it, interestingly, uh, studies look at kids when they're home over the summer and you would think that they would be healthier, but they're actually definitely more sedentary and they're, there's more of a trend towards childhood obesity rates increasing because there isn't that structure. So, it, you know, studies show that when kids are in school, they're, they're making, they're more structured and they're making better choices and they're moving more overall. Yeah. Um, so like, you know, I feel like the overarching theme is here is kids need to be in school right. <laughs> full time in person. <laughs> well, I mean, I hopefully, hopefully we're getting back in that direction. My kids have been back for a little over a month and I've definitely seen a huge, just, I mean, everything is going better, but I know for some, for a lot of our listeners, that's a ways off. Um, so uh, when we come back, we're going to take another quick break, but when we come back, let's just kind of distill this down, right? So this is a little overwhelming. There's a lot of kind of bad news, right? Um, and if you're just a mom trying to do your best and you're juggling your work and like, that's hard. So I know Julie, that healthy food has been a big priority in your family life. And so that's something I'm sure you've carried forward into the pandemic, however you can, even with some slip ups, um, which we all have, right. Or those, oh my gosh, what have my kids eaten today moments. Um, so when we come back, I would love for us to just kind of talk around some really doable ways, uh, maybe starting back from when this became such a focus for you that you did kind of shift your mindset away from hiding the broccoli toward encouraging them to like the broccoli or try the broccoli um, and to learn to recognize healthy food and for you to prepare it for them. So we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we're going to just try to distill some of this down in a way that makes sense. You know, Megan, I was thinking the other day about how much a mom's feet go through. Oh my gosh, right? I mean, we spend so much of our lives upright, walking our newborns to sleep, standing around with a baby on our hip, chasing toddlers, standing on the sidelines to cheer kids on, standing at the stove to make dinner. Our feet really clock a lot of hours. Yeah, so the shoes we put on those feet make a big difference, which is why we love our sponsor, Vionic. Vionic knows that moms want shoes that are cute and stylish, but that we need our feet to feel supported and cushioned. Vionic's three-zone comfort with ultimate arch support is clinically shown to help with plantar fasciitis and heel pain. Right. So the three zones are your heel, your arch, and the ball of your foot. And Vionic's shoes are amazingly supportive. Megan, I know you love the boots and those Lady Boss blue suede loafers you got through Vionic. And I'm a huge fan of the sneakers. They're just perfect for my work at home mom life and keep my feet totally comfortable for walking the dog or running out the door for school pickup. But they're so cute. I always feel pulled together. Vionic's 30-day wear test means you can try Vionic, and if you aren't thrilled, return your shoes for a full refund within 30 days, even if you've worn them outside. Check out VionicShoes.com to see the latest styles and use the promo code THEMOMHOUR for free shipping all year long. Again, it's V-I-O-N-I-C Shoes.com, and the promo code THEMOMHOUR will get you free shipping. Sarah, is it weird to admit I'm kind of jealous of my dog's personal care products? <laughs> Okay, once upon a time, I may have thought that was weird, Megan, but since trying out our new sponsor, Scouts Honor, I have to agree with you. These products are really nice and they really do smell great. So we don't really bathe Moxie that regularly in the winter and she's a hound dog, so she just gets really smelly. We have been using the Scouts Honor deodorizer and it makes a huge difference. You just spray it on her coat and rub it through so there's no need to rinse. And I love the dog in the woods scent which is essentially sandalwood and vanilla. And we humans use dry shampoo all the time, so why shouldn't our dogs? It feels good to give old Mox a bit of pampering, even on busy days. I love that. Well, we love the detangler for Xander's curly hair, and I agree, it really does smell so great. And Scout's Honor products help our doggies feel less itchy and irritated because they contain probiotics, which help balance the bacteria on their skin. We think your pup deserves a little pampering and that you deserve to have a less smelly house. So check out all of Scouts Honor's award-winning products today, available online or wherever pet supplies are sold. And to receive 20% off your first order, go to scoutshonor.com slash mom hour. Remember, that's scouts with the K at S-K-O-U-T-S-H-O-N-O-R.com slash mom hour for 20% off your order. Okay, Julie, so we have talked about some heavy stuff right now. And again, anybody who wants to dig more into those issues um, should go check out Food Issues. Um, and we will definitely give the link to that in the show notes and at the end of the episode. But um, if you are listening to this and you're like, okay, I've heard enough of the research and what the experts are saying, I'm just a little overwhelmed. I just want to do my best for my family. Julie, I'm wondering if you could share sort of your journey um, from learning about 
I think you called it functional medicine to deciding to implement better eating habits in your family and just kind of how you did it and how you're doing it now. Yeah. So I think that what was really important in our family um, is that I started from the beginning. So Mm. I think a lot of what parents struggle with is they, you know, around age two, it's developmentally appropriate that your kid is going to become a picky eater. Yeah. And I think people get frustrated and say, ah, they're a picky eater. They go only eat chicken nuggets and white bread and white this and white that. Um, but I think that, you know, with, with most kids, I think if you're consistent and it's just part of your family, it's like any other thing that you do. Like if you go to church or if you, um, I don't know, if you take a walk after dinner every night, or if you have a family movie night, that's what your family does. And so I think that's, that was what we did from the beginning where that was just how we ate. And so, for example, when my kids were toddlers, I would make a big salad for myself pretty much every day. And that's what I would eat for lunch. And then they would see that and they'd want it because they want to do what you do. Right. Um, and so it was just, you know, family meals were a big part of our lives, cooking with them. Um, when they were babies, I would puree lentils and feed it to my daughter. Like we just, that was how we ate. Um, And also, you know, my daughter has food allergies. So that kind of really helped us in a way, because whenever we had to go anywhere, I'd have to pack something for her that was safe. And so that Mm. cut down on a lot of things. But then, of course, when you go to school, everything changes. Yeah. um, And they want what the other kids have. And that's that's been a big struggle for sure. But and, and that's fine. And I will definitely be flexible and and, you know, buy goldfish or a snack that they want. Um, but they know pretty much, you know, 90% of the time we're, we're eating healthy, but yeah, you have to, you have to balance it as well. Um, I think one of the important things right now during the pandemic is we all have to give each other grace and give ourselves grace. There is no perfection ever. And we're all just trying to get through the day. Um, so I think, you know, if you don't have dinner every night together, it's okay. You know, um, I think making small changes, you know, try to have dinner one more night or try not to put your phone at the table or try to cook one meal on a Saturday together with your kids, something like that. Um, there have been so many days where my seven-year-old will make dinner for my other child. Not hot dogs or steakums. <laughs> no, no, yeah. she will. Make, she makes huevos rancheros. Okay, okay nice. But, yeah, but she can make like basic stuff because I'm wrapping up work or I'm working out or I just can't like get to it. Um, and that's okay. You know, there have been times, especially over the last year, where they're bored and they go in the kitchen and make a huge mess. And they made these, you know, what they think are great cookies. And there's been a lot of baking. Right. Right. And that's okay because it's just the way it is. So we just have to kind of realize that we can only do the best that we can right now. So, um, but one of my, you know, I'll, I'll kind of distill it down to three top tips to get your kids to eat healthy and raise little foodies. Uh, so get your kids in the kitchen. One of the biggest things, I know it sounds so overwhelming, but it doesn't have to be, you can make salad dressing. You can teach your kids how to make eggs. You can roast a new vegetable so studies show that, you know, the more kids have choices and more they feel empowered and they, they participate, the more likely they are to, to make those healthy choices. They feel so excited when they can get in there and make it themselves. They feel proud. Um, so that's really, that, that's really helped my family a lot. And we bake a lot, but we definitely cook a lot. And um, another tip along the same lines is there's so many times where I do batch cooking. So I'll cook like a whole bunch of like you do with on the cheap pan with a yep. bunch of broccoli and I'll pull it out of the oven and I'll leave it there to cool. And they're walking by. Oh, can I try that? Mm-hmm. Um, so that's really important. The other big tip is eat with your kids. So as much as possible, try to have a family meal and it doesn't have to be dinner. It can be breakfast. It can be lunch. We're all at home eating lunch with our kids. Um, that's really important because again, they're seeing, oh, this is how mom and dad eat. This is how our family eats. And it's not going to happen overnight. They're not going to suddenly say, wow, I want Brussels sprouts. But the more times you offer those Brussels sprouts, they will come around and try to switch it up, you know, roast it, add bacon, add cheese, um, do, you know, make it as a salad, as shredded up, make it as a salad, um, just as many choices as possible. And so that leads me to my next point is that kids love choices. 
So um, one of the things we do is like, again, I don't have time, so I'm taking out leftovers, but it's not leftovers. It's a buffet. Mm -hmm. So I take (laughs) everything out and they have a buffet night and they get to pick what they want and everyone wins. Um, Another great way that we do choices in our home is to have like a make your own taco or pasta or pizza night um, so they can customize whatever that is. You can also, like I said, serve um, different, you know, vegetables in different ways or served a cooked vegetable and a raw vegetable or a green vegetable and an orange vegetable or two types of vegetables um, and then let them choose. And if they don't choose, that's okay. It's just the consistency of it. And then finally, you know, bring your kids to the grocery store. I know that sounds so horrible. Like I hate it too. Yeah. I, I, <laughs> when I bring them with me, I just dread it because they want to look at that. They have a question. They want this. They want that. Um, but it's an opportunity to to say, go pick out a new fruit or go pick out a new vegetable. And I don't know how to make it, but we'll figure it out. And we'll pick out a recipe and we'll do it together. Um, and also, you know, the farmer's markets are open now. So that's yeah. another great way to get new types of vegetables that you've never had before yourself um, and get them in the kitchen with you. I love that. And I, and I just will point out if a farmer's market can be a little more of an easy point of entry, if you have really little kids, because you're not like stuck inside of a building with a toddler, (laughs) you're outside, there's lots for them to look at and see there's, it's not as noisy. If they're loud, it's not as noisy. And you can kind of just like approach a booth, look at stuff and then book out of there. Like you don't, you're not as committed. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, And you could also do, you know, you could also take that concept to uh, doing online shopping. If you're doing, if you're having your groceries delivered, you can sit and look at food with your kids. And something about that also feels like a little lower pressure again, because they don't have to sit there and like be completely in the process from beginning to end. It can be kind of like, Hey, mom's trying to put together um, a menu for the week. Come over here really quick help me pick out what we're going to make. And then they get to be interested and engaged in it that way. So even if you're not like going to stores right now, or the idea of taking your kids to the store right now is terrifying. I think there's ways to like that concept, you know, to do that concept without necessarily doing that. And that's one thing I think right now might just be a little easier in some ways, actually. Definitely. Um, Julie, I wanted to touch on a couple other things that you said. Um, one was that you mentioned, um, at the very beginning, um, the way was Rancheros that your I think it was your daughter or was your your son? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. I have two daughters. You have two daughters. That's old. right. Yep. Yeah. Okay. And um, and I love that because it just shows you that like healthy food does not have to be complicated. I think sometimes yeah. we get this idea that like for it to be a healthy, interesting experience for your child to like you know get um exposed to all these different foods and flavors that they have to be something that you would get from like a gourmet magazine or like some really fancy influencer site or something, but this is simple food and it doesn't have to be dinner food. I think that's such another interesting point you made. Like a healthy meal can be lunch. It can be a salad. It can be a snack. Like there's so many different ways to do that, that it doesn't have to be like, we're all available at six 30 and I had an hour and a half before that to cook this huge meal. <laughs> and I, I, it sounds like you're saying that is not how it plays out in your house. Oh no, no, <laughs> we, I'm all about simplicity. So it's, uh, you know, salmon with a vegetable or, you know, um, last night it was pasta and meatballs and a side salad. And my daughter helped me with some of it. And, um, definitely like really, really easy things because yeah, who has the time, right? right? Yeah. Yeah. And I love how you also said, um, just add cheese. I actually have got <laughs> my kids to like, I think it's so important not to get hung up on certain ingredients, not being like, like being bad for kids. Because if you have the idea that like, say cheese isn't good for kids. And I don't know that anyone believes that, but I'm just saying that if you have the idea that you're avoiding fat, say, or, or dairy or something like that, you might then miss the opportunity to offer your kids like the broccoli that they would gobble up if it had cheese on it or whatever it is. And it's so yeah. my approach has always been like offering as many different options as possible, because I hope in the end, they're going to learn how to cobble together like a healthy diet out of m- m- like endless options, not like something super restricted, which is kind of just the flip side of only eating chicken or white yeah. food, you know? So that's right. Yeah. 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 Well, Julie, this has been such a great interview. I'm so excited about your new podcast. Um, I hope people will check it out. It's called Food Issues, and 
you're basically going to be everywhere that podcasts are found, right? So whatever app people listen to. Um, and people can also go to your website. Can you tell them more about how to find that? Sure. It's julierevelant.com. Okay. Julie Revelant. And please spell your last name. Yes. R E V. E E L A N T, not re- relevant, Revelant. <laughs> yep. I know it, that tripped me up a few times when we first started talking to. Um, yep. And we will definitely link that up in the show notes and um, and Food Issues, the podcast as well. So, uh, Julie, so excited to talk to you today. Everyone, check out Food Issues and um, can't wait to hear how it goes. Thank you so much, Megan. Thanks again for listening, everyone. And again, if you want to check out Julie's new podcast, Food Issues, you can find it at julierevelant.com or wherever you listen to podcasts. Sarah and I will be back with a More Than Mom episode on Sunday. So check back soon and we'll talk to you then. 